Hey everybody, Joe from Humcrush here. I know, I know, it's been like a gajillion YouTube years since I've posted a video, but hey, look right here, a new video from your cranky old Uncle Joe. So quit your bitching. Now, you're probably asking yourself, what the hell am I doing in headphones behind a big old podcasting mic? Well, even though a dynamic microphone like this doesn't really have a place on set or on location, more and more of us that are most comfortable behind a camera find ourselves either filming things we never expected, like podcasts, or we even end up in front of the microphone ourselves. Make no mistake, video podcasts are not only a thing, YouTube wants to make them a much bigger thing. And hell, I'm just interested in the space, and whatever I'm interested in is what makes it on this channel. If you came here for camera gear, sorry, maybe next time. If you want to learn a bit more about this kind of microphone and get some tips on the Shure MV7 specifically, keep listening. So, a few years ago, I got a Blue Yeti to play around with because when you don't know what you're doing, you get a Blue Yeti. I know that all the cool kids hate on the Yeti, but it hates me. honestly, I think it's still a great place to start for a lot of people. It's well-made, affordable, and versatile. What it is not despite its looks, is a large diaphragm dynamic microphone. In actuality, three small condenser capsules are hiding in there. Well, who cares? Amazing microphones costing thousands of dollars use small condensers. What's the problem? Well, if you're recording in a sound booth, nothing. But if you're recording in a less than perfect acoustic setting, then the lower sensitivity of a dynamic microphone might actually be desirable. Condenser, dynamic, what am I talking about? Well, those terms describe the mechanism that converts sound waves into analog electrical signals. Condenser mics use the electrostatic principle to do that. Dynamic mics accomplish the same thing with electromagnetics. Doesn't matter to you, except all things being equal, it takes considerably more energy to activate a dynamic element than a condenser element. The electromechanical element of a dynamic microphone is literally less sensitive. Everybody hurts. Less sensitive sounds bad, right? Sometimes. Well, for certain applications, high sensitivity isn't necessarily desirable. If the only thing you want to record is someone's voice, and you want to eliminate ambient noise and reflections, then a highly sensitive microphone might actually be counterproductive. A mic that never even responds to those undesirable sounds effortlessly delivers clean, dry audio. A sound that would take a lot of work to even approach in post if recorded with a more sensitive mic. Now as an aside, good dynamic microphones should essentially have zero self-noise. So that's another thing you don't need to worry about in post. Technobabble aside, if a vocalist or a podcaster gets right up on a dynamic mic, very little other than their voice is going to get recorded. And that's true whether they're on stage or in their bedroom. Now, you can actually exploit the same principle with a Blue Yeti. Get as close as you can to it, and then set the gain as low as you can, while still capturing your voice at a reasonable level. Your voice will be so much louder than the room reflections or your neighbor's leaf blower that you'll approximate the sound of a dynamic microphone. Unfortunately, you'll also amplify a lot of the undesirable mouth noise, and you'll have to be extra careful to avoid p -p -p plosives. 
Check, check, sibilance, sibilance. So you absolutely can make a condenser mic like the Blue Yeti work. Countless lovely sounding podcasts do just that. But if you know you're specifically buying a mic for broadcast slash podcast slash streaming, you might want to limit your search to dynamic microphones. So that's why you might want a dynamic microphone. What are the downsides? Well, not so long ago, picking a dynamic microphone pretty much eliminated the possibility of a simple plug and play recording directly into your computer. A dynamic mic with a large diaphragm, the part that actually gets moved by the voice, well, that requires a lot of power. The Shure SM7B, the microphone that most podcasters aspire to, I'm not, I'm not an anti-vax person, is infamously power hungry. So much so that most preamps require additional muscle to drive it. People often like to use something like a cloud lifter or a fet head, which siphon off phantom power to provide several dBs of clean gain. So yeah, dynamic microphones used to almost always be analog XLR microphones that required an extra doohickey between your mic and your computer to convert that analog audio signal into digital data that conforms to the USB audio standard. That combination of a preamp, an analog to digital converter, and usually a headphone amp too, is commonly referred to as an interface, or a USB interface, or extra hassle and extra cost. Now, personally, I'm not that concerned about the extra cost because I already have a Sound Design Mix Pre 3 that I use for location sound recording, and it has incredibly clean preamps and can also function as a USB interface. I've already spent that money. But it's still one more thing to remember to carry around to power. I mean, it's a vital tool on set, but in my studio or in a hotel room, it's just one more thing to go wrong. And when I need to send a microphone to someone for remote recording, it's hard enough to get them to show up on time and hit record, let alone coach them through futzing with an interface. Luckily, in 2022, there are several options for good dynamic microphones with built-in USB interfaces that are just in plug-and-play as the good old Blue Yeti. So after way too much research and a bunch of testing, I've decided that the best option for my use case is what you've been listening to for this video, the Shure MV7. Now there are gobs of reviews of this microphone from people way more qualified and entertaining than me. So I'm not gonna take you all the way through unboxing to configuring the included software. You've probably already seen those videos anyhow. I'm just gonna point out a few little notes, good and bad, that either I wish I knew or that I think are particularly salient to drive home. Number one, for better or worse, the MV7 is not a USB version of the SM7B. The SM7B was designed to record anything. The MV7 is designed to record the spoken voice. The SM7B emphasizes the lower mid-range for a boomier, some would say warmer response curve. Conversely, the MV7 rolls off the low end. If you want that signature radio voice from the SM7B, you just get right up on it. My five-year-old daughter sounds like Barry White. A song that deals with how I feel about you. To get that sound from an MV7, you'd need to EQ. In my opinion, if you want a more transparent reproduction in the tonal range where most voices set, that's the MV7. Number two, the MV7's windscreen is useless. If you buy the MV7, go ahead and add an RK345 to your cart for another 12, 15 bucks. It's the SM7B's replacement windscreen, but it fits. The additional length stops plosives dead in their track. Peter Piper picked a podcast. It's really quite amazing the difference it makes. Number three, the MV7 doesn't come with a shock mount, so watch out for handling noise. Anything physically connected to it can make noise. Of particular note are your headphones. Just touching the cable can translate into your recording. Number four, whatever choices you make in Shure's Motive app, they're actually driving hardware processing in the mic. They stick even after the app is closed and they'll be recorded by your DAW. Now this is great for live streaming, but if you're recording a podcast, best to turn off all those effects and process your audio in post with more sophisticated tools after the fact. Number five, you can't turn off these distracting LEDs on the mic, but you can at least dim them if the mic will be on camera. You do that in the Motive app. Number six, while the mic does have a far mode for scenarios in which you can't be right up on it, avoid it. It's essentially a bunch of different 
aggressive processing techniques to try to compensate, and it doesn't sound great. I mean, if that's how you need to place yourself relative to your mic, buy a shotgun condenser mic. This mic wants to be about this far from your mouth. Number seven, speaking of processing, don't bother with the mode of apps limiter. It's practically useless. Number eight, any mic, condenser or dynamic, $200 or $2,000, needs compression and EQ. If you care at all about your listener, you simply must use an EQ to compensate for your voice in your room, and then use a compressor to deliver a file appropriate for a wide variety of listening environments. Buying a better mic doesn't change this reality. The good news is that the signal from the MV7 stands up pretty well to processing. Number nine, the ADC inside the MV7 is really good. Honestly, it's hard to hear the difference between it and my $700 Mix Pre. That said, it's great to have the option to use XLR connection to go into a mixer or recorder when the situation calls for it. Something I couldn't do with the Yeti. Number 10. Set your mic's gain appropriately. If you're coming from a condenser mic with noticeable self-noise, you might be tempted to underdrive the MV7. Don't. If you're recording 24-bit straight into your DAW, even when it looks like you might be clipping, you probably aren't. The data is there, just waiting for you to compress it into range. A good signal straight out of the mic is preferable to boosting in post. Now, I'm a really soft talker, so for me, that's way up around 31.5 dB in the mode of app. For you, it's probably a more reasonable 20-something. Number 11. Even though a dynamic mic is more forgiving, the MV7 doesn't eliminate the need for good technique. Once you've normalized and compressed levels for delivery, your heavy breathing and all those annoying mouth noises, all that distracting junk is going to be revealed. You still got to keep your mouth wet. You got to enunciate, use a gate, use a de -esser. This goes for your recording environment too. You're still going to have to deal with a noisy or reverberant environment, either by fixing it at the source or in post. A dynamic mic isn't magic. It just makes all this a little easier. Number 12. Similarly, if, like me, you don't have a particularly pleasing voice, the MV7 isn't going to miraculously make you sound like Mike Delgadio. Check, 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 check. Now, it's hard not to be disappointed by this after dropping $300 on a new mic. It's really easy to overprocess your voice chasing that voice actor voice. But trust me, you're just better off leaning into what you already have than trying to radically alter it. Remind yourself that some of the most popular podcasters don't have particularly great voices. Here's the EQ curve I use with my voice in my room. Nothing radical. To sound better, the best I can do is learn to speak up, to enunciate better, to stop saying um and uh every third word. The MV7 can't help me do that. All right, I think that's all I have to say about the MV7. Again, I'm not a sound guy. Take anything I say about audio with a grain of salt. I'm just learning and sharing. Some much more qualified people that I've been watching and I recommend that you check out are, of course, Curtis Judd, Bandrew Scott, uh, Alan at Sound Speeds, Booth Junkie Mike Delgadio, of course, um, Tom Buck, Mike Russell, and probably a lot of other great people I'm either forgetting or haven't discovered. So if you have a favorite audio guy on YouTube, drop them in the comments. Let's see, what else? Well, I guess if for some reason you found this video helpful, like and subscribe. And oh yeah, get out there and crush it.